some traditional Catholics of a German-Austrian background substitute good old Saint Nick for the Christkind. From the way I understand it, the Christkind was an invention by the heretic Martin Luther as a means of pulling people away from the cult of the saints. Whether that is true or not, I'm wondering who is a better, who's the better choice for Catholic families, Saint Nick or the Christkind? I've heard this too, and frankly, uh, I'm not sure that, it, that it's true about Luther, but I have heard it, and I, I don't know, I don't have an alternative story. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like using the Christ Channel as the gift giver, and the reason why I don't like it is because sooner or later you're going to have to explain that the gift, that the appearance of gifts may not have a supernatural origin. It's hard enough explaining about the real St. Nicholas. Yeah. Drawing the Christ child into it, uh, I'm not comfortable with, but that's yeah. just me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if it works for you, great. You know, uh, it's, again, like the kill, as with the killjoys, you know, we don't want to get, if you've got a, a family tradition where the infant Jesus brings the gifts, and that's working well, then God bless you and may he continue to bring them for many years more. Okay. Uh, our last question for today, Oberon asks, Who is the gift giver in your family when you were growing up? And who is it in your household today? And no, the answer can't be Cardinal Mahoney. Well, firstly, he's destroyed the whole question because of where's <laughs> Cardinal Mahoney gave me the gifts when I was little. Uh, we'd leave out a, a dish of brownies and scotch, and in the morning the brownies would be gone and the scotch glass would be empty, and we'd have coal in our uh, stockings. No, no, none of, that. <laughs> none of that's true. Stop that. No, uh, who was it who, uh, who brought it? Well, frankly, it was Santa Claus. It was Père Noël. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, it took me a long time to find out that he wasn't really coming. You know, I was like 23 or something. Uh, well, all right, maybe not quite that old, yeah. 18, but, uh, <laughs> no, I remember when, I, 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 I frankly heard as early as when I was six, terrible rumors from bad children that it wasn't Santa Claus, but I refused to believe it mm. because I was a good kid. Yeah. And I was able to hold on to my belief in Santa until at least nine. Uh, I have to admit it was hard. But my father, um, when the unfortunate reality came out, my father explained it to me in a very, very sensitive way. And this is why I go back to not really wanting to involve the baby Jesus in this, in this process. Because he was there in a world of his own on the nativity set. You know, that was the whole reason for being there. Yeah. But Santa, Père Noël, he... Uh, my father explained to me that he really was real, it was St. Nicholas, and that um, the spirit of St. Nicholas is the most real thing on earth. And that, you know, we, we, we uh, have these people dressed up as Santa and go through all this sort of thing uh, to bring a bit more magic and enchantment for children than there would be otherwise. He said, you're not going to seriously tell me that you didn't like the magic and enchantment. And I said, well, no, I couldn't say that. He said, well, the, um, and, I, and honestly, you know, there's, I know a lot of Catholic families have the thing, should we lie to our children? You know, you don't really want to put it that way. While, as I've said on the one hand, I don't like identifying the baby Jesus too closely with, with the whole thing because of the inevitable disappointment. By the same token, enchantment is an important and powerful thing. Where would our lives be without it? Very poor things. If you think about it, that's what love is about. When a parent looks at his family, or a father looks at his family, a mother looks at her, at her family. When grown-up children look at the elderly parents they have to care for. What is it? What is it that makes them continue to make the sacrifices they have to make? The answer is enchantment. Because, and you could say, oh, they're deluding themselves. You can. And a lot of people do today. That's why we live in such a nasty, unpleasant world. But the truth of it is, 
the satanic enchantment. And not just the Christmas kind, although it's a good example. That enchantment flows through every pore of our being, if we let it. Every day, God comes down to earth on, in uh, bread and wine. That's enchantment. The age of miracles is not over. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm gearing up to write this book on the Holy Grail, so I'm doing my research. Well, there have been a lot of these Eucharistic miracles in recent years. Strange things. Red and wine turned to blood and flesh, just like Lanciana. Weird stuff. The age of miracles is not past, neither is the age of wonders. And if we realize that, whatever unpleasantries we have to go through, we'll manage them. And we'll be happy, more or less, with them. Those who refuse to see the enchantment, who refuse to share the joy of dance and the great dance, they're the ones who are deluding themselves. And deluding themselves with a bloody, unpleasant kind of delusion. You know, it's one thing to have the delusion that you're a millionaire and you go wherever you like and travel to the Riviera. But at least it's a pleasant delusion. Imagine that you deludedly thought you were working at a coal mine and were going to die at age 45. That's a pretty stupid kind of delusion to have. And yet, that's the sort of delusion the world we live in would like us to have. That it's all dreadful and all awful. By no means. You know, I took my uh, nephew up to Santa Barbara last weekend to see the Christmas Revels, which are a, uh, uh, a presentation that started in Cambridge, Massachusetts back in the 50s, and about nine Revels companies around the country now. And what they do are um, explorations of Christmas through different, in different cultures. In this case, it was Scottish and medieval Scottish. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do everything Spanish, French, Cajun. It depends on where you are and what they're doing that year. But it was, a, it was a wonderful show. And the people doing it were having a good time and all that. Um, and that's the thing about Christmas. It's the only one of our feasts yet that the world as a whole still feels some obligation to bow to. They may try to cover it up with holiday, or by saying it's pagan, or by doing everything they can to efface its true nature. But they'll fail. And so, if we have no more questions, mm -hmm. I would just like to say to uh, our wonderful audience here in episode 15, uh, it's been quite, quite a ride this year, and next year promises to be even wilder. Don't forget Christmas and the joy that I hope each and every one of you are going to feel over the next few days. And keep it going, not just to the New Year, not just to the Epiphany. Keep it going to Candlemas. This last gasp is really until you get your throat blessed on February 3rd for St. Blaise Day. Uh, it isn't the greatest feast we have, that's Easter, but it's a splendid one. And from the bottom of my heart, and I, I know my elven companion here feels the same way, uh, God bless all of you and give each of you a very merry, holy, and happy Christmas and the very best of New Year's. God bless you and good afternoon. <laughs>